One of the most common questions people ask me is how do I handle pressure? Um, pressure is interesting to me because remember, I believe that I'm at ease. So pressure is created by dis-ease. And dis-ease is truly created by ego-based consciousness. And so there's four steps to deal with pressure. One is to identify the need of the ego that is determinative upon creating pressure. See, the ego is not what most people think the ego is. The ego does edge goodness out of your life. The ego is not your amigo. This is all true, but it's not just a narcissist, a self-serving, greedy, egotistical type of ego. See, the ego is what creates the pressure and the pressure is created by the needs of the ego. Let me explain what they are. The need to be right creates pressure. The needs to be separate from, the need to be inferior, the need to be superior, the need to be anxious, frustrated, angry, guilty, resentful, all of these needs, and there's many more, they create pressure in your life. It's an illusion. It's a self prophecy that creates a, a closing of the learning curve, a closing of the comfort zone. This is where the pressure is created. So what do we do? One, we practice identifying, especially what we're more uh, apt to be needy of. So for example, I have a terrible need to be offended. And it's a terrible need to have because the minute I walk outside, if you have, I have a need to be offended, you know how easy it is to be offended? I always tell people, I wish I could feed the world as easily with their need to be hungry that I do myself with the need to be offended. I walk outside, I'm like, oh, can you believe that person's walking by my, oh, he, right? It's amazing. Do you know how much time, emotion, value, and energy is wasted by this pressure creating ego-based consciousness? So what do we do? We practice identifying it. Now, counterintuitive to after we're able to identify the ego-based consciousness that creates pressure, don't resist it. See, the natural reaction to the need to be guilty, resentful, offended, separate, inferior, superior, anxious, frustrated, and angry is to resist it, to go over it, under it, through it, around it, oversell it, back and sell it, lie to it, manipulate and cheat it. Don't do it. Simply stop. Simply stop. Breathe through your nose, out through your mouth. Breathe, get to center, get at ease. And then roll towards what you want, who you can help, who can help you, how best to get it done, and prioritize what's important to you. Not what's important to other people, what's missing and what you don't want, but what's important to you, and apply that why. Don't search for something you already have. Apply the why. If you can identify this pressure, these ego-based consciousness, these needs, and stop, drop, and roll, you'll spend minutes and moments each day under pressure, in the majority of your life at ease, in the flow, where things come to you effortlessly, rapidly, and accurately. Well, when I started out, I didn't realize the why was within. <laughs> the, the why existed through my faith that I didn't have, that there's something bigger than me that loves me more than my mom loved me. So my why was more on the motivation side of why. See, there's two sides of why. The motivation side of why gets you up, gets you back up, get you started, get you back started, but it's a soul sucker. It's an, a, an unbelievable energy, but it can't get you there. The why that I live on today is the inspired why, which we were talking about before. But when I started out, I lived on that motivational side of why. My why was to buy my mom a house and a car. It was based off of putting my attention and intention onto a, a, an effect, an outcome. Everything I did was for that outcome to buy my mom a house and a car because I believe that money would buy me love and happiness. The only love and happiness that was missing in my life was financial love and happiness. I was blessed to have an extraordinary mom, extraordinary family, extraordinary siblings, extraordinary health. All the things that I don't take for granted today that other people wish for, I had them already. I just thought to complete the set that my why would be this economic, you know, unbelievable gain. And I had to learn the lessons, like I told you, a lot of pain, setbacks, failures, mistakes had occurred in my life to say that I don't have to search for my why. I need to apply my why. Still under the context of enjoying the consistent every day, persistent without quit, pursuit of my potential, my truth. But instead of putting my attention and attention on the outcomes, I moved it over to the cause, which decrease the interval of time because the interval of time exists between cause and effect. 
When people put their attention and intention on an outcome, guess what? It takes a lot longer, not just pragmatically a lot longer, but worse, exponentially longer in relative time. So if you and I, we sit here in Southern California, we're driving to Maine, and all you keep telling me is, can't wait to get to Maine. Oh my God, we're gonna be eating lobster in Maine. This is gonna be amazing. I'll be so happy when we're in Maine. And all I look at is, all right, what's the most efficient way to get to Maine? Should I pack my, my food? Should I bring a bucket for me to go to the bathroom? Uh, you know, I'm, go I'm going to drive as efficiently as I can and my attention's on the cause. Yours is on the outcome. I not only will get there faster pragmatically in man-made constructive time in the, in the 24 hours a day, but relatively, even if you beat me in pragmatic time, which you probably won't, relatively, it will take you so much longer to get there, which is true time, the relativity of time. Yeah, well, I'm applying my why to get to a midterm or long-term objectives. I'm very systematic about the activities I have during the day. So I have these five daily practices that allow me to take in increments of one day and use midterm and long-term objectives as a trajectory, not an outcome. So each day I wake up and say, yeah, you know, in six years when my son graduates from high school, this is what I, I, I wanna do. I'm gonna make some changes in my business, you know, of the activity I get paid for, the activity I don't get paid for, spend more time doing this. I wanna to live to over 111 years old, so that's a very long-term objective. So then I say, well, consider these things that I'm looking to do. It might be buy a penthouse in San Diego when I'm 60. Now, all I focus in on today is what do I need to do to move in that trajectory? Personally, experientially, giving wise and receiving wise. Then I say to myself, now that I know what I need to do today, who can I help with what I wanna do and who can help me? Then I move to how to do it. These, you know, how can I be efficient? And the three lenses of how, by the way, which had really changed my life, is when I look at how it's gonna happen, I look at how can I be more productive, provide more value, how can I be more accessible, which is a bifocal lens. So it's not just how am I more accessible to others, but how am I accessing what I want, personally, experientially, giving and receiving, and the lens of gratitude. The lens of gratitude is the ability to find what? The light, the love, and the lessons in it, which decrease the relativity of time, as well gives me a more positive mindset, more positive heart set, I feel better, and allows me to be more efficient, effective, and statistically successful with my actual hand set. And so I use those lens to see the activity I plan, don't have planned in my sleep, which we can get to, and the activity I get paid for and I don't get paid for. Once I do that, my what, my who, and my how, then I can prioritize my now. Still keeping into consideration the trajectory that I wanna buy a penthouse when I'm 60 and I wanna to live to over 111. Too many people spend their whole day worrying about the penthouse when they're 60 and living to 111, but they don't do what it's gonna to take to get there. And then they wonder why they're, once again, getting what they're missing, what they don't want, or what other people want for them because they haven't utilized this exercise. Sleep is one of my favorite topics. I study sleep, but it's also the only mentor that I've had for over a decade. I have a sleep coach. So sleep's the most important thing in my life. It's the number one habit that everybody shares and spends on average a third of your life, eight hours a day, on average most people spend sleeping. The most frustrating thing about sleep to me is that the majority of the world goes to sleep at night and wakes up more tired than the one who went to bed. It doesn't make sense. We could all go out to eat and two hours later, if we all looked at each other and said, man, I'm hungry, we would know there's a problem. But there's some reason people don't focus in on sleep. On the average person's life, it's 26 years of your life and they have the wrong idea about sleep. Sleep is not rest. Sleep is recovery and access. So for me, I have studied my sleep, I have a sleep coach, I travel over 200 days a year, but I get better sleep for recovery, to put my mind, body, soul in a more recovered position the next day, but also to access information. See, I plateau and grow. Most people live their life like a tube because they don't understand sleep. What does that mean? Food in, food out. They're tubes. They live like the stranger in Camus, right? The myth of Sisyphus says, push a boulder to the top of the hill all day long. And where is it at the next day? At the bottom of the hill? No, if you study your sleep, know 
exactly what your sleep cycles are. Mine's an hour and 32 minutes. I know that I can't wake up in the middle of a sleep cycle. I'm better off to have two sleep cycles than two and a half. And so for me, I have an unwinding routine. I shifted the paradigm of man-made constructive time. My tomorrow starts today. So people ask me, when's your day start? 9 p.m. You wake up at 9 p.m. No, I don't wake up at 9 p.m. But what I do is I unwind at 9 p.m. every night. I put myself in a position to recover and access information subconsciously and unconsciously so I can plateau and grow. I'm not starting my day at the bottom of the hill. I'm not living like a tube. I'm actually putting myself in a better position to accelerate, grow, just like the universe is. And it's amazing. That's why I meditate first thing in the morning. It used to be to practice being quiet. Once I get good at that, it's actually to access the information that I've downloaded from the night before. And my mind, body, and soul is in a better position. So I'm growing and accelerating and I'm notating a new baseline for the day. Why? So I can identify the pressure. I can identify the ego-based consciousness, stop, drop, and roll, and go back to that baseline.